Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, my name is Bobo Lowe, and it's my great honor and pleasure to moderate this final panel session of the Riga Conference. Um, our panel uh, is covering an extraordinarily wide range of subjects, and we want to really discuss, elaborate on, maybe clarify a number of themes that have emerged in the course of this incredibly stimulating conference. Questions of global order and disorder, uh, the workings of the international system, great power competition, the tension and contradictions between geopolitics and interdependence, and of course, the complex dynamics of relations between the United States, China, the European Union, Russia. Now, to lead the discussion, we have three distinguished panelists. Furthest from my, uh, me is uh, Nick Redman, Director of Analysis at Oxford Analytica. To his left is Mercy Kuo, uh, Executive Vice President of Pamir Consulting and a regular columnist with The Diplomat. And on screen here, we have Robert Lee, Office Director for the European Union and Regional Affairs at the US State Department. Now, I wanted to start by putting a few large questions to our panelists, but also to you in the audience, because we want to make this as interactive as possible. So let me kick off with one question which is always on my mind, is we talk a lot about the rules based international order. But what do we mean by this? Has it become almost a parody, a cliche? How meaningful is the concept of a rules-based international order? Or is the reality that we're living in a, a new world disorder defined by great power confrontation and what former British Foreign Secretary uh, David Miliband called serial rules breaking? The second question is also a little bit about the rules-based international order. It is that w there's no question in my mind that Putin's invasion of Ukraine is the worst breach of international order since North Korea invaded the South in 1950. But there's a paradox. Maybe what Putin has done in Ukraine has served unwittingly to revive the concept, the principles, the institutions of an international order. And in this, how should Western policymakers aim to persuade the unconverted? Now, Joe Biden, at last year's Munich Security Conference, spoke about the world reaching an inflection point, and he spoke a world, about a world divided between authoritarian regimes and democracies. <laughs> The question I always want to know is, how meaningful is this divide? Um, how useful is it in terms of global problem solving, for example, in areas such as climate policy? Or you know, does it actually hinder our capacity for global problem solving? And where does the global south fit in in such a binary vision? And then becoming a little bit more specific, the US-China relationship, which is obviously on many people's minds. Is it some sort of accommodation between Beijing and Washington feasible? Um, the former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd spoke about managed strategic confrontation, uh, excuse me, managed strategic competition. So is that possible? And if so, on what basis? Or is the should we resign ourselves to the fact that US-China confrontation will be the norm uh, while Xi Jinping is China's supreme leader and anti-Beijing sentiment is so strong in Washington? And on that note, how do you assess the likelihood of US-China competition, confrontation, turning hot, because some people talk about a new Cold War, but for others, <clears throat> we're already beyond the new Cold War. The real danger is of a new hot war. 
And on the EU, can the EU become, finally, a serious geopolitical actor, exercising significant influence not just in Europe, but beyond Europe, in the Indo-Pacific, as the last panel was discussing? And if so, what steps do you, does the EU, does NATO, do EU member states need to take to kind of realize this vision? Because it's one thing to say, yes, we understand that geopolitics is important, but what are you actually going to do about it in terms of active policy? And what is the future of the European Union's relations, not just with the United States, but also with China and Russia? And finally, talking about China and Russia, how do you see the future of the Sino-Russian partnership in light of the war in Ukraine? Do you see it, as many do, <clears throat> as an authoritarian alliance, an arc of autocracy? Or do you see it instead as perhaps an increasingly dysfunctional relationship um, in which the war in Ukraine has exposed the limits of that so-called no-limits friendship. And if the latter is true, then how can the United States and Europe take advantage of this situation? So Nick, you have the unenviable task <laughs> of, of setting things um, and getting things going. Thank you, Bobo. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, has Putin weakened the order or has he unwittingly done it as favor as, uh, as Bobo suggested? I think that's going to depend partly on the outcome of the war in Ukraine itself. He certainly dispelled, if not shattered, the complacency that existed in parts of this continent, uh, continent prior to February 24th. War has come as a profound shock to states that were so invested in norms and tried so assiduously to promote them that perhaps they could not recognize what was in front of them. So if I may nod to the recent remarks of Joseph Borrell, who talked about Europe as a garden and the rest of the world as a jungle, and in doing so, courted the real controversy, I think it's understandable in the sense that if you felt you were living in a garden, you've suddenly been made very aware of the jungle on your doorstep. And perhaps those who, if I may continue with the horticultural just for a moment, Bobo, perhaps those who are so keen on cultivating the garden had a vision of what the garden might be they lost sight of the encroachment of the jungle, of the jungly features. Has the response strengthened the order? Bobo, you spoke about what the order is, and I think that's a good question, because we hear terms interchangeably. I, I think it's probably about 2016, 2017, mm. when first this term came up, and it was, is it the liberal order? Is it the liberal international order? Is it rules-based? We seem to have focused on that, but I'm not sure we've really nailed it down. And I think part of the problem is, what is the order? The base is obviously the UN Charter, but the rules-based order has multiple elements mm. uh, and institutions, and it's not consistent over time or geography. Mm. Um, history may judge that some developments in the last 25 years uh, might have been well-meaning, but might have been something of an overreach. Um, perhaps there was too much of a sense in the part of some Western states that history was moving inevitably in their direction, and they didn't stop so much particularly at the UN General Assembly, to do a tally or a head count of exactly, exactly how many states uh, were with them. So I think we have to accept that for much of the world, and here I'm thinking mainly about the world beyond Europe, the order was not always particularly orderly. And certainly it was not enforced uniformly. The invasion of Ukraine, I agree, Bobo, uh, is the most blatant example of one state tacking another we've had for a while, although maybe on a par with actually Saddam going into Kuwait. Um, um, but there have been other conflicts in the world in this century, not strictly state-on-state -state conflicts, but internal conflicts that had quite nasty external intervention elements to it. So it brought states into direct contact with another without shocking the United States or Europe into such firm action as we've seen over Ukraine and without those states also seeking to demand that all other parts of the world joined what we might call team enforcement. So while in the UN General Assembly we have votes on Ukraine's territorial integrity that command massive majorities, the appetite for sanctions enforcement is the exception rather than the rule when we go beyond the transatlantic mm. area. Mm. The refusal of states in the Middle East South, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America, in many cases, to join sanctions reflects a view on Russia. I'm sorry to say it, 
but this is your conflict. This is your problem. You didn't care that much about ours when we were suffering it. And so now please don't ask us to join your sanctions regime and hurt ourselves because this is one that you really care about. So we continue to live, I think, in, in what Hedley Bull called uh, an anarchical society. There is a system of rules and institutions in the world, but it's a society governed by those that clashes often with the pure power politics uh, of classical interstate uh, rivalry. And the societal aspect is not always, or rarely in fact, the dominant feature. Society is not dead. Uh, many regional blocks have standards of behavior and they uphold them, whether it be the African Union, um, ASEAN, or the Organization of American States. The incentives to play by the rules and to have the protection of those rules persists for many. Developing states will wish to signal, and this is where we come back to Headley Ball and paying your membership dues to the yep. anarchical society. Uh, if they accept those rules, benefits will flow from them. Uh, final thought on this. Rules require updating and they require broad consent. Do we have the mechanisms to achieve these? Also, dividing the world into West, East and South, particularly in the case of the South, which involves some very unhelpful lumping together of countries and implicitly putting ourselves at the top of the pile might not be a helpful way to proceed. On democracies versus non-democracies and Joe Biden, um, the global South, and, and let me touch on climate change briefly. To be fair to Biden, the pro uh, focus on democracy was partly a response to demands in the US domestic environment in the previous few years. And he has left the door open um, for broader cooperation on climate. But I think there's a difficulty in determining which states uh, might count as democracies and how far we choose to set the bar. I was very struck by um, uh, Zambia, which had a, a wonderful um, uh, orange revolution moment in a way in 2021 and was going to have a starring role at the US uh, Summit for Democracies. And then a few weeks before um, uh, that was due to happen, I think the president made some unhelpful remarks about gay rights and all of a sudden the conference needed a, a new poster child. It's quite difficult. What are the standards we're, we're promoting? Plenty of states have elements of democracy and authoritarianism even within the EU, and then we can look at states such as Turkey or Indonesia. By pressing the distinction between democracies and non-democracies, the United States is sending a message to the developing world that a choice is coming if it isn't there already, and that might not be very helpful. I think particularly China, and it's the only thing I'll say about China, mercy, do the rest to you, uh, intends to test to destruction Biden's claim that democracies are better than others when it comes to challenge, tackling the challenge of climate change. On climate, there's an urgent need for global action, uh, which must cross those divisions between democratic states and the rest. In 1750, um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was 280 parts per million. It passed 300 in the early 20th century. It passed 400 in 2014. If we are to limit the increase in temperature to 1.5 degrees, which is the narrower target within the Paris Climate Agreement, we can't go above 430 million. Mm. That's how close we are. That's how little room for maneuver there is left. Our governments are very keen to espouse uh, net zero 2050 pledges. They are much less forthcoming on the challenge of the fact that we were supposed to be cutting global emissions from 2025 onwards and scaling them steadily down. The battle for the climate is going to be won or lost in Asia. Actually, that's not right. It can be lost in other places, but it can only be won in Asia. Um, talk of the superiority of democracy, even in India, is not going to be helpful in addressing this challenge. And the same is true of states of Africa. In fact, some of them, notably Gabon, are quite willing to be partners on this, but have no, willing to go, uh, have no wish to go ahead on uh, 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 on a democratization agenda. Uh, Gabon, I mentioned just now, is the lead, uh, the lead nation in the African group of climate negotiators. It's even more wooded than Latvia, by the way, 88% uh, forested. And its leader uh, is trying to develop his forests as gigantic carbon sinks as a way to, uh, to raise money. 
um, also a way to spike the guns of donors uh, who might otherwise criticize him for illiberalism. Green authoritarianism in Gabon uh, could go elsewhere. Um, on climate, we cannot choose our partners. We can only choose yeah. how to engage with them. Thank you, Nick. Um, you raised, even just in five minutes, you've raised so many interesting questions. I, I was taken by your uh, comment that rules require updating. And there is a sense in much throughout much of the global south that the Western conception of a rules-based international order was designed by the West yeah. overwhelmingly for the benefit of the West. And that those rules reflect a 1945 situation when the West was dominant and not the world today. That leads to another question that I have, which is something that Malcolm Chalmers, director of research at Royal United Services Institute, once said. He thought that there was no such thing as a unitary world order, that there were multiple orders. There was a liberal international order. There was a global economic order. And then there was a UN-based order. And that there, obviously there was some overlap in those orders. But um, the idea that there was a single unitary conception of a rules-based order, one dominated by the West, was ultimately unsustainable. What do you think? I think it is unsustainable without reform um, for the reasons that you uh, have outlined, that it's a Western construct in a world that is no longer Western dominated. I think also there are, it's probably more useful to think of regional orders yep. rather than global ones. There can be certain rules which are global rules and can pertain quite broadly. Um, but in particular regions, as norms of behavior are, are going to differ. But I, I, I come back, I, I think it is very important. How on earth do we design the mechanisms to, to review. Um, um, Boba, as Boba knows, uh, uh, I spent most of the last decade um, attending once a year a big uh, Asian security conference in Singapore. And I think it was probably about 2016, 2017, I first heard the term rules-based order. And around about 2017, 2018, I saw one or two Western foreign ministers stand up and say, if you want to talk about change, let's talk about it but I didn't hear any advance on that. And I don't think you can just say that as a Western foreign minister. I think you have to say, if you'd like to talk about this, let's talk about it. Maybe we could look at this here, maybe we could look at it there. You can't just open the invitation. You have to start structuring and facilitating the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Mercy, I wanted to shift the conversation a little bit from the broader questions of order or orders to the somewhat more concrete today's ongoing confrontation between the United States and China. Now, Jake Sullivan and others have talked about a combination of cooperation or collaboration, competition, and when necessary, confrontation. But I, it seems to me, looking from the outside, that the confrontation part of that triad has become all dominant. What do you think? Well, thank you, Bobo, and thank you, first of all, to the Riga Conference for org inviting me to join this timely conversation. In these perilous times, the global order is being dramatically and rapidly reconfigured in the contest I would submit between democracy and autocracy. For Moscow, reviving Russia's influence across Europe is paramount. For Beijing, restoring China's centrality in the world system is indisputable. For Russia and China, ex exporting an autocratic alternative to the US EU led liberal world order is a shared imperative. For the United States, cohesive coordination with like minded allies and partners in Europe and the Indo Pacific is pivotal in preserving international rules and norms. So, my remarks will briefly consist of two parts. First, just a general framing of the geopolitical context. And then I'd like to share just from the industry perspective, private, private sector perspective on the impact of geopolitical risk on business bottom lines. An aggressive China with a revanchist Russia are shaping the geopolitical environment for, to serve their mutual interests. With China's support, 
Russia's assault on Ukraine is testing EU and the U.S.'s long-term capabilities and commitment to, um, to countering authoritarian aggression. As, as China and Russia raise the stakes of this geostrategic competition, Brussels and Washington face strategic choices to, to define the rules of engagement and optimize the outcomes. Now, with specific regard to U.S.-China relations as the most consequential strategic relationship in the global arena, U.S.-China rivalry in many ways is underpinning this contestation between democracy and autocracy. China is using Russia's war on Ukraine to undermine U.S. leadership and sow discord in transatlantic relations. Beijing perceives the West sanctions on Russia as a harbinger of possible consequences mm -hmm. facing China in the event of conflict over Taiwan. A cross-strait conflict would upend stability and security in the Indo-Pacific with detrimental impacts on global supply chains, sea lanes, and market standards. So in targeting the European Union as the world's largest single market, and global standard setter, China is uh, exacerbating intra-EU friction. And how is it doing this? Through economic coercion, disinformation campaigns, forced technology transfers, and industrial espionage, just to name a few in a wide array of tools. Uh, the Chinese government apparatus, which includes the CCP, the Chinese intelligence agencies, the public security ministry, the PLA, and the United Front works in coordination with Chinese commercial and research entities is extending its reach on a national and subnational level in Europe, in the United States, and in international organizations. So here I'm going to conclude by just sharing from uh, um, as one who advises Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies on how to manage geopolitical risks, I'll offer three observations. First, China's economic weaponization and its instruments are sophisticated, ubiquitous, and unrelenting. The U.S. companies lose between 225 to 600 billion dollars annually as a result of Chinese corporate espionage. The second point is policymakers and industry leaders need a China strategy with effective tools to repel these coercive measures. And finally, to conclude, Beijing, from at least the industry standpoint, is using global economic interdependence to exploit vulnerabilities mm. in national economies and companies to advance the Chinese Communist Party's global agenda. That's really interesting, Mercy. I, I want to ask you a couple of questions, that's sort of fairly related. You say that China and Russia are tr seeking to export uh, an autocratic model of governance. But it seems to me that they're such different countries with such different types of regimes that I'm unclear personally what that authoritarian model of governance looks like and how it would be applied anywhere uh, with any degree of success. Surely, both countries are on the make. It's not so much they wish to convert you, rather that they wish to exploit you, which is, I think, a different mm -hmm. priority. Right. The other issue is that you say that uh, China is a, like, wants to sow discord within the West. And I, I think I'd probably agree with that assessment. But surely the Russian invasion has done exactly the opposite. That the Russian invasion of Ukraine has had a unifying effect on the West. Transatlantic relations are stronger than they have been in a very long time. The United States has rediscovered its leadership mojo and China's strategic options, including in the Indo-Pacific, have been somewhat constrained. So I'm just wondering if I can push you a little bit on those two issues. On the first question regarding the uh, exporting autocratic uh, alternatives, uh, you're right. Of course, 
China and Russia are two very different countries. China, though, in the commercial realm, uh, is exporting the elements and components of a surveillance state. Its technology, surveillance technology, is uh, there's a high market for that in the global south. And uh, the social credit system that it's being used also is appealing uh, to this part of the world. And um, the more control of the, the populace, that's also can be appealing as well. So this is a kind of Chinese brand of authoritarianism. With Russia, it's, it's less commercial. Obviously, we have seen it's uh, um, more on the political and military, geopolitical. Uh, but the point here is that actually, I do agree, it has been a clarifying moment for the West. And actually, it's also been a clarifying moment for the Indo-Pacific countries in the Indo-Pacific to decide. And this has been a common recurrent theme throughout this conference. What are our values? What do we stand for? Yeah. What's the countervailing narrative that is being, that Russia and China are promulgating to the rest of the world? And if there's a questioning of, this is not what we want, maybe it will help clarify, well, what do we want? Yeah. Right. So I would submit, uh, just for the sake of time, that here it's really about the narrative, yeah. the, the, na the explanatory power of, and the Chinese have a term for this called discourse power, where they are very keen to have multi-layers of this narrative at, at different levels so that it can shape and form attitudes. Thank you, Mercy. Um, we now go to uh, Robert Lee. Thanks very much for joining us uh, from Washington. I know you're incredibly busy at the moment. Um, your background is in Asian affairs, but currently you're looking after uh, uh, EU and regional affairs and state. Um, I'm very interested to see how you look at uh, the future of transatlantic relations. Now, people are saying, oh, the West is back. And my in natural reaction to that is, yes, but for how long? How resilient do you see uh, transatlantic relations uh, in, in coming years? Thanks, Memo. And <clears throat> let me um, also just thank the conference organizers for uh, inviting me to speak. and. I apologize, I can't be there in person. I look forward to a future opportunity to visit um, Riga um, and to our friends in Latvia, Labdin. Um, this uh, discussion really takes place at a very um, pivotal moment. Um, we've seen Russia double down on its uh, illegal, unprovoked, uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Uh, with uh, its illegal and attempted a annexation of its uh, neighbor's territory, which we and the countries around the world uh, thoroughly rejects. Um, at the same time, we're, this conference and our conversation is taking place as the 20th Party Congress wraps up. And we're seeing a uh, essentially a doubling down of a one party system within China, um, where we can expect uh, increasing um, uh, oppression at home in China and increasing China behaving increasingly aggressively abroad. Um, and everything that we've seen in the party Congress seems to re reinforce that. Mm -hmm. So this is the context of the conversation. And I, I think, let me just touch on, before responding to your question, Bobo, let me just touch on the issue of the international rules-based order. We've had quite a bit of discussion on it, and it seems almost too abstract and ill-defined. But at, at its very core, basic principles enshrined in the UN Charter, uh, concepts like sovereignty and territorial integrity, and not using or the um, threat or use of force to change borders, to take territory, those are some pretty basic and core principles in terms of how states ought to relate to one another. 
Now, these concepts have not been enshrined in world history in memorial. It was developed actually in the, in the midst of uh, the Second World War, where the very term United Nations came to represent the countries resisting and defending against the Axis powers. Um, and these basic principles were framed as a rejection of uh, what the Axis powers were uh, pursuing at the time. And so I, I think at its very core, these basic concepts um, are really integral to peace, stability, prosperity, not only in the uh, Euro-Atlantic region, but globally. It really serves as the foundation on which globalization has taken place. And China's very rise uh, from the time of the 1950s, where it was nearly a, a autarctic state, isolated, to where it is now as the second largest economy in the world. Um, that rise certainly was due to the hard work, diligence of the uh, people in China, but it was also facilitated by the stability in order that these principles uh, foster. So I think in terms of an international rules-based order, the idea and very concept behind it is really to shift away from a might makes right approach that has really mm. been the operating assumption throughout history. Oh. And so while the uh, architects of that order may have primarily been in the West at the time, those principles have been, been widely accepted and in fact enshrined in constitutional documents in countries around the world, including in Africa, Latin America, the Indo-Pacific, as well as countries in the West. So I think those principles have, have been widely accepted and those who question or reject this idea of international rules-based order as a Western construct, um, I share Mercy's um, uh, thoughts about the alternative narrative. I have yet to hear a compelling and convincing articulation of the al alternative vision that um, folks who criticize a international rules-based order would uh, present and what fundamental objections they had to the concepts of territorial integrity and sovereignty um, well, well, and resolving differences by uh, by, by uh, peaceful means rather than force. So let me just turn to your question sure. about the state of uh, transatlantic relations. I think certainly the um, full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia has really animated and reinforced the need on both sides of the Atlantic to work more closely together in recognizing that how the fundamental values and principles that we deeply believe in and represent are under uh, unprecedented threat. So we've been able to take really um, urgent and unprecedented action, both in terms of support for uh, the brave people of Ukraine to defend their country, but also to hold Russia to account. Okay. So I think we are discovering the um, the power of uh, our relationship when we stand united in a way that really has not been tested like the way it's been tested over the past year. Okay. Um, and, and so I, I think as we look forward, um, one of the lessons learned is about the risks of strategic dependencies yeah. uh, with countries that fundamentally do not share uh, our views of 
basic and fundamental values. But Robert, can I so, just come into something please. here? Because you, you talk about a shared vision of a rules-based international order, and, but I want to bring that in to transatlantic relations, because surely one of the sources of transatlantic tensions in recent years were the actions of the Trump administration, whose commitment, if any, to a rules-based international order seemed wafer thin. So there's a concept in, 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 in the idea that the Trump administration seemed almost guided by the quasi-Cartesian principle, I can, therefore I will. And so there's a sense that, well, it's, it's all very well for the United States to say, uh, to commit to a rules-based international order. It can do so in conjunction with the West and much of the world when it suits its interests. But when it defines its interests in other ways, then its commitment to a rules-based international order starts to fray. How would you respond to that um, accusation or charge? Thanks, Baba. I th think um, clearly there were uh, strong concerns uh, within Europe and elsewhere uh, about s some of the signaling that had taken place. But I think fundamentally um, the United States and its people uh, have a, uh, it, the principles and the approach of the United States and its role uh, in the world. There has been a consistency in a bipartisan uh, approach. Okay. So I think some of the concerns um, from the previous administration uh, represented, although there were some departures uh, from, from uh, sort of the historical approach by the United States, I think underlying um, the overall U.S. policy, you'll see, and it's reflected in our approach in Ukraine, that there is a very strong bipartisan support uh, over the course of the past year about the need to support Ukraine and yeah. to hold Russia to account. Okay, And right. so I think going forward, um, th this will be, in terms of the U.S. overall uh, in its role in the world. This is an issue that is uh, part of the debate within our domestic politics. Okay, right. So, Thank you. So I think um, it's it's fair to to say that um, th this is a period where the U.S. is also in terms of its uh, wider population reflecting on its role in the world. Right. But we have seen in over the past year the response, not just from government, but from the public. And it's not just in polls, but in terms of the outpouring of support uh, okay. for Ukraine. And it's larger than the issue of Ukraine itself. But I think there's this recognition of the, the threat posed by Russia, uh, not to just Ukraine, but to this Base, these basic principles that we talked about. Thank you. No, no, I agree. Um, we have around 20 minutes. Um, so please, if you'd like to make any quest, uh, put any questions, make any interventions, please introduce yourselves and please make them single questions or one point interventions. Who'd like to set, get the ball rolling from the audience? Not yet. Okay, well, in which case, there is a question from Slido, which is about what tools does the West have to use as carrots or sticks moving forward? I assume the re uh, that's in relation to uh, China and Russia. Um, would you like to have a crack at that, Nick? Tool. Tools and carrots and sticks, okay. Um, uh, unity? would be certainly one, um, Western uh, company, countries acting together as a force multiplier. Uh, there's still a lot of development aid that they can uh, mobilize. There's a lot of trading power 
uh, that can be applied, um, greater R&D um, to strengthen themselves internally. I think there's, there's quite a lot to do, but it's, as much as anything, it requires a mental shift because certainly if you're a US decision maker for the previous 20 years, you've been used to a world where there was no peer competitor and now there is. So um, a more widely playing of the cards uh, is called for. Let's see. In terms of carrots, I would say uh, being articulating a clear vision about what the values are, as I mentioned earlier. We know the West is not a homogenous entity. Okay, so it has to be very localized or on a national level, but clearly explaining, well, in this global disorder or chaos, what do we stand for? What do we believe in? And that would be, if there is an allure or attraction to that for the rest of the world, it should stand on its own uh, as, as that narrative of conviction and principle and belief and ideals. The second is, I would say, people-to-people -people relations, mm -hmm. exchanges, education, understanding. There is a great concern now in the United States that with China uh, not I inaccessible to young scholars, that the future of American understanding of uh, China in the foreign policy, pro foreign policy profession will be great detrimentally uh, impacted just because there's this lack, increasingly lack of just interchange between students and academics. Okay, so education, people, people to people diplomacy. Sticks, I would say, and here I, I speak in the context of China, holding China accountable. Accountable whether it is uh, the tools that it uses in commercial industry, as I listed earlier, hold them accountable require transparency. Uh, the SEC now has asked for auditing of all Chinese companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. The more light that is shed on Chinese auditing practices, mm. Uh, mm. Uh, shareholders, this is a must. If we're really serious about keeping international rules and norms in, in terms of international business, development, investment, and of course, technology, all these things to shine that light on what China is doing and Russia is equally. Robert. Thanks. Um, i just make a couple of points. One, in terms of tools, ensuring that the Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine uh, results in a strategic failure is probably the most important thing that we, um, and by we, I mean the United States, our allies and partners, not just in Europe, but also internationally, um, to ensure that uh, Ukraine prevails uh, in defending its country. It's, uh, I think, of principal importance huh. uh, because it will send a signal and it would create a lesson uh, for others. Uh, so if Putin were to succeed in it, his ambitions, I think that would provide a very dangerous lesson learned uh, by others who would uh, consider emulating his action. Um, on, in terms of carrots and sticks, I think there were some comments earlier uh, and in discussions about challenges like climate change, um, where it almost seems like there is a, um, a binary that we either, uh, that in order to work with China on climate change, we need to concede um, and accommodate its ambitions in other areas. I think for example, on the issue of climate change, China has its own interest in ensuring that the world takes bold action to address the uh, climate change crisis. And so just as 
uh, idea if you look at the geography of China and how many of its um, biggest cities are along the coast and how much they would be under threat. Um, China has uh, its own um, critical interests mm. and really shares an interest in making sure that the world does more uh, to combat climate change. And we would welcome China taking more aggressive action and taking a leading role in demonstrating to the world what they can do. We will see at Sharm el Sheikh whether China um, takes up that opportunity. And yep. it's been one of the areas where we have been engaging with China. That has been cut off recently um, uh, by, by uh, Beijing's decision. Yep. But I think it's not helpful to think about the need to trade off on core principles in order to somehow entice China to act uh, to help address global challenges, including issues like climate change yeah. and uh, COVID. Absolutely. Um, Mercy, you spoke about holding Russia and China to account. One of the problems, I think, in the non-West is the perception that the West talks a good game but doesn't actually follow up. It doesn't practice what it preaches, both in its own policies, and it takes an indulgent attitude uh, towards China and Russia in practice. So, for example, we talk about auditing and uh, uh, trying to clean London from dirty money, and yet London has become the money laundering, is seen by many as the money laundering capital of the world, so much so that it's called London grad. But the other, so that's, I, I wanted to push you on that, push you all of you on that, but also this idea that even if China behaves well, what place is the United States going to give it or allow it in terms of global order and governance? We come back to that 2005 concept of a responsible stakeholder. Now, clearly, things have moved on since then. So, uh, what, what does responsible stakeholder mean in practice for China in what is still going to be a US-led global order? Does it mean just China playing a more prominent role, but still very much a secondary role and not really being a rules maker along with others? Or does it mean um, out and out strategic and normative competition? So I just wanted to ask all of you, let's start with you again. Um, okay, on London grad. Yeah, <laughs> I think there is, um, uh, again, a popular thing maybe to say to Western audience, but I think there is, there is a Western image problem, which is on multiple fronts, is around hypocrisy, about sort of, uh, dealing or facilitating money with London as a sort of butler and banker of, of the world, and extends on our um, uh, foreign policy behavior over the last 20 years with um, Iraq on the charge sheet and uh, Libya and what happened in Syria. Uh, and on climate, there's a whole climate justice um, uh, discussion and debate uh, about who has what share correctly of the carbon budget globally, um, which the net zero debate has actually entirely glossed over. So um, I think in addressing the rest of the world, um, uh, a little more uh, Western um, humility would probably go mm. quite a long way and then enforcing some of our own rules which you know, looks like it's more likely to happen now in, in london and yeah. certainly as, yeah. as mercy said the united states is getting a lot tougher on on some of those financial stringencies yeah. 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 Mercy. yes uh as you as you rightly said well the uh the initial thinking i think in the west uh when china entered the wto that it would, by learning, entering into the World Trade Organization, learn the international rules and norms. And this concept of being a responsible stakeholder in the international community, that thought, that thinking underpinned uh, the policies, particularly in the United States, of how to engage with China. And for a while it did. Actually, China benefited greatly from that, the, <laughs> those decades mm. of really open markets, 
tons of chi American investment into China. You can name all the blue chip companies that went there to invest, set up operations. So, so it's ironic that China is now trying to be a, a, a rules, I, I would say, maybe not breaker, but a rules, rewriting the rules, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. okay, yeah. of the international rules and, and norms mm. into with Chinese characteristics. Mm. So it's been a beneficiary and now it has, uh, it feels like it's bold enough to come in to say the UN and uh, for example, it, it sends its uh, senior officials to be a part of the standards writing for telecoms and uh, um, ICT so that China now can influence how the standards are being uh, written. Now, where, where is this going? Yeah. The question, is it going to be more confrontational? Well, here we're going to come to Chinese domestic politics. As you all know, the 20th Party Congress is in process right now. Earlier this morning in Beijing, there have been clear indicators that Xi Jinping is really solidifying mm -hmm centralizing uh, his control at the highest levels. Tomorrow, again, I think Beijing time, we'll have a very clear confirmation of the, the, his team uh, when the Politburo is introduced. Yeah. But the indicators are already very clear. He is surrounding himself with loyalists. Mm -hmm. There will be an echo chamber around him. He has now full license to do what he wants. And those of us who watch China very closely are expecting a very aggressive uh, muscle, muscle flexing approach to the US and particularly to the cross strait issue. Okay. So if we are to your question, if we look at what are the indicators of China's possible behavior, uh, there's a, there are some clear indications when Xi Jinping in his opening speech mentioned the word in Chinese security 91 times and the number of times reforms was mentioned only 48 that is the lowest number okay of reforms mentioned in any speech given at these party congresses what is my point we already have a bellwether of where china is going so expect a more assertive more aggressive china if it gets to your earlier question of a hot war well, again, I would say we'll look at indicators. I think the U.S. presidential elections in 2024 will yeah. be also a clear indicator of the U.S. Mm. U.S. Mm. leadership and the direction that this whatever leadership ends up in 2024, how it will lead the U.S. and shape the U.S.-China relationship. Yeah. Robert, I'll come to you in a moment, but I just wanted to take a question from you. Yeah. First. Uh, Irina Kuznetsova, I'm on the board of LATO uh, and the co-founder of a Democracy Festival here in Latvia. Um, my question will be, will be about quantum technologies because we all know that the United States and China have been racing to achieve quantum supremacy, uh, that is um, to develop applicable quantum technologies. So how much should we be afraid if China comes first are there any real security risks for the, for the West? Thank you. Okay. Um, gentlemen, about five rows, hand up there. Hello, my name is Vestros Berzinc. I represent Yata Latvia. And I wanted to ask a question to the whole panel. Oftentimes you hear that China is threatening global order, the current international order. And I wanted to ask, uh, Quite recently, I read a book about the China's 100-year plan, how China will become a global hegemon in the future. So I wanted to ask, how does Russia's invasion of Ukraine impact this goal? And does it help China become, uh, get one step closer to become a global hegemon? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm also going to put the final round question. The US national security strategy speaks about a decisive decade coming up. So just for a nice, easy answer, how do you see the end of that decade looking? What sort of relationship will the United States have with China? Where do you think a rules-based international order or a world disorder will be? 
Where will Russia be? How do you see the sort of shape of international politics at the end of that uh, period, decisive decade that the national security strategy talks about? Rob, why don't we kick off with you here? Thanks for those uh, easy questions. <laughs> um, as you mentioned, the national security strategy that was re released uh, just this month um, talks about the U.S. strategy fundamentally as a three-pronged approach. First is to invest, invest in um, just domestic strength and capabilities um, and to ensure that the base within the United States is strong, it's healthy. Um, so a lot of the investments in infrastructure, our commitment on uh, addressing climate change uh, through the recent Inflation uh, Reduction Act, all those can be rep represent efforts to make the United States stronger uh, at home. Um, and the alignment portion is critical in terms of working with our allies and partners around the world to ensure that those who believe in the fundamental values and the goodness that's been brought about through um, the international rules-based order, that we work even more closely together um, to, to uphold those principles and those values. And finally, uh, in terms of competing, to be clear that there is a competition yeah. in terms of competing values and competing vision. We believe that the vision that we stand for and that we work with our European allies and partners, partners around the world to support and uphold is the one that would provide the best prospects for peace, security, and prosperity. Okay. All right. Um, so that is our fundamental approach. In terms of that competition also, there was a question about quantum um, you'll note that recently the U.S. Department of Commerce issued new rules that would uh, impose export restrictions of quantum and uh, artificial intelligence technologies uh, to the PRC. That is a recognition that we are at a com in a competitive space. Okay. That doesn't mean that we are looking to completely cut off trade. Um, and just as a matter of fact, the United States remains the largest trading partner with the PRC. Okay. So we can have competition and we want to do this in a way that would allow for peace and prosperity to be maintained. Okay, so thanks. at the same time, we want to be careful about avoiding strategic dependency. Yeah. And that's one of the principles lessons learned from okay. the Russia-Ukraine situation of avoiding the uh, strategic de dependency that would leave us vulnerable. No, and that message comes across. Like, that message just comes so across. To that, uh, I think that was something that came out from the European Council discussion from yesterday, from the readouts that we heard yeah. from President von der Leyen and Michelle. Okay. Thanks. Um, Nick. Okay, I don't want to filibuster the minister, so I'll just go for your question. Um, uh, Russia weaker? Uh, China stronger, United States still in the game, and the order, even though a little bit bruised and battered, I think is going to be in reasonable condition. It's quite difficult right now because obviously we've seen in other parts of, of the former Soviet Union, South Caucasus, also Central Asia, an, in, an uptick in, in conflict and tension recently. I think that's inevitable when you see such a flagrant breach and when you see uh, an incumbent power that is evidently distracted. But nevertheless, I'm hopeful that that can calm down a bit and so we'll end the decade not in the worst case. My joker, um, an election taking place in 25 months time <laughs> at the other end of the Atlantic area. Of course. Mercy, you have the final word. I, I do want to address these two questions very yeah. quickly because they are both very good questions about mm -hmm. technology. The US new uh, uh, highly restrictive and broad sweeping export controls on AI and semiconductors to China will, will very much constrict China's development of quantum computing and AI and high technology. So it will set China back significantly. It, it doesn't mean that it will cut it off, but it will just take more time for China to develop indigenous chip and quantum computing technologies. It's definitely on their path. Uh, they are definitely on that path. And then in terms of the hegemon question, 
I think here, if we look at the threat vectors to this notion, we have to look at Chinese internal politics. Chinese history has shown that when a leader is, gets to a point where they're so isolated or fully centralized power, the power base becomes very brittle and fragile, and therefore there's the greater uh, uh, risk for volatility. I'm not saying that will happen, but we have to watch China's internal politics for that question. And then finally, um, the, the national security strategy Bo, that you mentioned. The first line of this document says, we are in the early years of a decisive decade for America and the world. The last sentence in this document says, there is no time to waste. Mm. So time is of the essence. Uh, the European theater and the Indo-Pacific theater are increasingly interli interlinked. Russia's war of choice on Ukraine today could portend China's conflict of choice over Taiwan tomorrow. Yeah. So as the stakes and risks continue to escalate, the, sh the space for hedging is shrinking yeah. and the time is narrowing. So I, I'll finally end with this. This decade and the strategic choices that policy, military, and industry leaders make could determine the direction of where this whole global order is going. I think that's an excellent note on which to end. Um, would you join me, ladies and gentlemen, in thanking our wonderful panelists, Robert Lee, Mercy Kuo, and Nick Redman. Thank you very much. St. Anthony's. <laughs>